So today, uh, you know, I thought we would um, go through various periods of film. So I do teach film history, and my, my love of uh, film history really came from my love of uh, wanting to be an actor. Um, you know, I would read biographies on actors that I admired, you know, just to see their paths and how, how they got there. And, you know, I would read my favorite actor is Al Pacino, and I'd read about Pacino, and his favorite actor was Brando. Then I'd read about Brando, and Brando's favorite actor was Paul Muni. I'd read about Paul Muni, and it kind of just spun off. And then, I, you know, I started really getting interested in, you know, directors like Kazan, uh, you know, Cassavetes, uh, Billy Wilder, John Huston, and, and you know, I just really developed this um, this love for film. So I look forward to uh, sharing, you know, my passion and my love. And I always tell my students in conclusion, and that wakes them up every time. So uh, uh, now I, I I teach a film class, and usually my classes vary. They vary from two to three hours, and typically I spend two hours just talking about one film and one genre. So bear with me, I'm going to try to compress the, the entire history of film. I mean, not the entire history, but the history of film, and we're going to tap into some significant periods. Uh, so I'm going to just, I'm going to move, I'm going to try to move quick. Um, I have the curriculum and I have the lecture planned from the beginning of its infancy all the way to the 1970s. So we'll see how far we can go. We'll go till three. And if, any, if I go a little over, if anybody has to leave, that's fine. Um, uh, and maybe shortly after three, if anybody has any questions or anything, I'll be happy to answer if anybody wants to stick around a little after three. So, um, so okay, so, uh, and I may, I may defer to some of my notes as well, uh, in case I have a senior moment and, and forget. Um, so, uh, I'm, I want to start from the beginning. <laughs> um, the, be the beginning of film. Now, prior to film, uh, there was something called uh, magic lantern shows. Anybody heard of those lantern shows that were like kind of glass, you know, shows that they would do? Um, now, does anybody know what the first motion picture was that ever, ever, ever seen? Birth of a Nation. Well, no, first, first motion, no, it wasn't, but uh, one of them, but yeah? Was it a horse running? Yes, it was a horse galloping, very good. So uh, I'm going to show you that shot. So there was uh, there was a <coughs> photographer named Edward, Edward Maybridge. Well, I'm going to show you for, uh, the first motion picture, okay? And the first motion picture was uh, a bunch of cameras, right? Still cameras lined up because this photographer, Edward uh, Maybridge, he had a bet with a friend. When a horse gallops, it lifts all four legs. So he lined up about, I believe, 24 to 27 still cameras, and he had them, he, uh, the horse gallop in, in a series of still shots in sequence. So I'm going to show you that shot, and let's see if we can see some sound. So this is the first motion picture. Actually, there's actually no sound in this motion picture. But, Yeah, but these are all still cameras in a series of sequence lined up. Just a few seconds there. And the guy actually, Edward Mumbridge, he actually uh, won the bet. And this shot was taken in 1878. Or excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, 1889, I apologize. So we'll just double check the sound here. He looks okay. I'm just going to play the To Kill a Mockingbird again. Oh, that was a. Uh, uh, we got a sound. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, so, um, so yeah. Oh, any sounds? All right, actually, I, yeah, I could talk a little bit while, while this is playing. Um, so this was really the first, the, the horse shot was the first really motion picture. Now, Thomas Edison, uh, he created really the first camera, the, this kinetoscope. 
Um, now, Ed Ed Edison wanted something better than pictures. Um, you know, he wanted a new version, you know, of the photograph. Uh, you know, so he added a metal cylinder to it, and he would put tiny sequential uh, photos and that, that were viewed through a lens, and then he would just crank them up. Now, back then, the cameras were about maybe 14 frames per second. Now, ca uh, cameras go anywhere from 25 to 35 to even more frames a second. So when you saw a lot of silent movies, and which I will point out to you, they were a little bit of choppy. They were a bit choppy, uh, you know, due to, um, you know, not many frames, uh, you know, that were being cranked uh, per second. Um, so here, I'm going to show you uh, now a quick clip. But so the the actors back then, you know, they all they all came from they all were part of vaudeville, you know. Uh, before we went, they transitioned into um, uh, you know silent films. So what I want to do is I want to show you um, a series of shots that Thomas Edison did with his camera. Because, um, you know, people can make the argument that that was the first motion picture, but technically Thomas Edison created the first moving uh, camera. So I want to show you a few, uh, few shots here. And, you know, they used to call films Nickelodeons. You know, you would put a nickel in, and you'd look in inside a little eye, eye area, and you get a, you'd get see this. You'd have a little form of amusement. So we'll look at a few of these. <coughs> and you know, at, at, at this time, movies were considered uh, second rate. You know, I think at this moment, you know, there was no idea of movie sense of, uh, you know, what those Nickelodeons were. Um, anybody here, the Lumiere brothers? So they were, uh, good, uh, good Mike, yeah, so they, they were uh, French brothers. So they really had, you know, you know, there were different stages of the advent of motion pictures, and they, they really had a vision to, instead of putting that little nickel in and, you know, looking inside, they had, they had a vision to project motion pictures like this in front of you know, a large, you know, audience. So they were very instrumental, you know, in that form of development. So, um, so now I'm going to kind of, I'm going to fast forward now a little bit. Um, so, you know, when the Lumiere brothers, they did their thing with, you know, projecting movie theaters, Edison did his thing uh, with um, the camera. Uh, the first movie studio was actually uh, in New Jersey. Uh, believe it or not, uh, before it went, came to Hollywood. Um, you know, uh, and there was a, a man named, uh, anybody here, Max Sennett? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, you know, Edison had his studio in New Jersey. And, you know, Max Sennett created uh, Keystone, Keystone uh, Pictures. Um, 
So eventually, a lot, uh, you know, these groups of silent movie actors went to Hollywood. Hollywood actually was known uh, uh, for fruit, uh, so it you know wasn't known for what we uh, you know know it today. But they used to film silent movies, believe it or not, on rooftops a lot because um, because of the sun, so they could kind of see where the sun was going and where the light was going. So they would, but. California, you had sunlight, you know, 350 days a year, so they really just went to California just for the sunlight, you know. Um, so during the silent period, there were many different, um, uh, you know, actors and uh, that came about. You had Max Sennett, who was married to a woman named um, uh, Mabel, uh, Mabel Norman. Is it Mabel Norman? Yeah. Um, and then you had Chaplin. You had Buster Keaton. You had, uh, you know, you had Harold Lloyd. And the first, they say the first movie star was a woman named uh, Florence Lawrence. Anybody hear of her? Florence Lawrence, yeah. Uh, and she actually, she actually invented the turning signal, believe it or not. Um, but she was regarded as one of the first uh, movie stars. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you um, a few little clips here. All right, so you know, filmmaking, you know, was uh, was was very uh, you know experimental. Uh, so th there was a filmmaker that I would like to show you because you probably have seen this shot. Um, anybody here of George Melies? Melies? Okay, so he was he he was very famous for a, a, a story called The Trip to the Moon. So I just want to kind of show you this shot here. Very interesting too how they shot it. I'm going to just skip. And you know, this may seem uh, rather, you know, maybe even primitive, and but for its time, it, it was pretty advanced. Trip to the moon. And that, uh, all these frames were hand painted, frame, frame by frame. And you know these were you know filmed in little sets and studios. They they didn't really go on location, and we're going to get into that period, which was uh, referenced neo realism, referred to as neo realism. All right, so I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of that. Um, so then there was so there was so there was another film directed by a guy named Porter. Anybody here of uh, a film called The Great Train Robbery? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, does anybody know um, uh, that that film? What foundation it laid out? What it created? In oh, hit the door. Thank you. Um, Okay, so The Great Train Robbery. All right, so that, that film was actually very revolutionary, believe it or not. Um, it was actually the first, it was actually the first film to cross-cut. Does anybody know what cross-cut means? What's, how, what's that referenced in film? So when, whenever you watch a movie, so say, um, say you and I were, were talking, right? And he's, he's going outside to get, get her. And we're talking and it cuts to him trying to let her in. So it gives the notion of uh, an action happened, two actions happening simultaneously. Because a lot of times if you cut, if you cut to something, you know, the audience might think like, it might confuse, back then it would confuse the audience, but it would give the illusion that these actions are happening simultaneously. So I'll show you uh, what they did here, which was pretty revolutionary. 1903, Edwin Porter was the, uh, the director.
sure anybody's seen this shot. Pretty iconic. <coughs> And you know, even though um, these films were considered more silent films, they they weren't um, actually silent because of silent films would have orchestras, and a lot of these orchestras uh, there would be about a hundred people in these orchestras, you know, with a conductor, you know, etc. Um, so I'm going to show you this crosscut clip here. Just skip a little bit. All right, so they're um, robbing the train. And you... Silent films from the delay anywhere? <coughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some, actually. L.A. was the epicenter. Is there anything that prevented them from doing talking films right away along with the film? Uh, no, not necessarily, but the first talking film was The Jazz Singer with uh, Al Jolson, 1927-ish. And actually, that film uh, only had talking just for a few minutes. The majority of the film was silent. All right, so you, all right, they're going on the horses. So what they did was they tied somebody up, and you see as they're tying somebody up, this person's trying to escape. So this is happening simultaneously as the train robbers are escaping. And then the girl comes to help him. That's cross cutting. And then there's another one too I'll point out. Okay, here we go. Testing. See, this is happening simultaneously, so they're dancing. So you see what I'm saying? Cross-cutting the, um, the, you know, the idea of multiple actions happening simultaneously and gives the audience that illusion without them thinking something that's contradicting. You know, because you know, cross cutting is really an action um, that's you know a, a localized environment. So, do they have recorded music? Uh, orchestras. Exhibit at Lachma of film clips from Paris, 1895 to 1907. Well, yeah, those were probably um, the Lumiere brother uh, films, most likely. Half yeah, and you know the French were uh, you know very instrumental uh, in the advent of film motion pictures. Um, okay, so um, so there so there was a gentleman that um, had asked me about um, if there were silent films that were filmed in uh, Los Angeles, which they were, and ver in various parts of uh, California. Um, and, and you could even, and even if we, we, and we're going to go back because I'm going to talk a little bit later about the significance of Los Angeles in, in film. Uh, so a film that I would like to show you that it was very iconic um, in a Los Angeles backdrop um, was uh, Safety Last uh, with uh, Harold Lloyd. Um, that was actually filmed in uh, downtown uh, Los Angeles uh, on Broadway. Uh, street. So it's a, uh, you know, there's a very iconic image of that. Um, and you know, back then, all the all the filmmakers 
and actors, you know, they would do their own stunts. You know, Buster Keaton, you know, the house would come on them, Chaplin, you know, they all, they all did their own stunts in those days, uh, especially here with Lloyd. So I'm going to show you this clip here from Safety Last. <coughs> And uh, how here Lloyd kind of practiced it, he, he, they would throw dummies down, uh, down the building to see how they would fall. He was actually, uh, Harold Lloyd was one of the richest uh, men actually uh, in Hollywood and actors. To, I think, uh, you know, interpret that. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of actors, you know, relied on their faces and, and, and their looks, and a lot of them, you know, came from vaudeville. So they, they were doing a lot of a comida dell'arte type of acting, which is an Italian form of acting, which is a lot of facial expressions. So he was really that high up off the ground shooting this? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, and you know, the, the significant movies of 1910 or earlier are 20 minutes or less. I mean, of course, this is 1923. Do, do they have safety nets or anything? I heard that. Uh, you know, I was trying to do some research on this. I was trying to see how he did it. I didn't see any, like, wiring or anything like that to my research, but I could be wrong on that one. Because I was actually trying to research to see how he was doing that. Do you know that, Mike? Did they have a safety net? I don't know. He's, a, he's my student, and he, uh, he's a silent movie expert. But, uh, oh my god. Not that I know. Look at that one. <laughs> oh! <laughs> in uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> All righty. All right, so we'll, we'll move on for a little, a little bit there. I know, I know that you guys enjoyed, enjoyed that one. Um, all right, so, you know, so I want to kind of, now I want to kind of jump a little bit because, you know, I want to try to compress as much as we can because we're going to go to the 1970s. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to, I want to cover few significant periods with you. Um, so, but with the silent movies, you know, um, you know, Greta Garbo was a silent movie actress, uh, actress named Lillian Gish. So I'm, I'm, I'm naming, I'm naming the silent movie actors that were able to transition into talkies because we're going to move into talkies. But of course I mentioned that the first, um, uh, talking picture, talkie was the jazz singer, with uh, Al Jolson. Remember that song, Sunny Boy? Yes. Yeah, uh, that's what he was known for. Um, so yeah, so the actors that were able to be successful in talkies, yeah, were you know, Greta Garbo, um, Lillian Gish, you know, um, and, and a few others, but most of them, I mean, Chaplin, Chaplin actually did, uh, you know, subsequent to talkies, he did silent films as well, but he would incorporate some talking, you know, like The Great Dictator, I think, is a great example, um, if anybody's ever seen uh, that picture. Actually, a very significant film, I think, especially in uh, today's times. Uh, but Chaplin, you know, did, did City Lights, which was already uh, subsequent to the advent of 
uh, talking pictures. Um, Modern Times, anybody ever see that film? Uh, yeah, it was a really great commentary on the, on the, on the Great Depression and the way, uh, the, I mean, there's a beautiful shot, you know, in, in the beginning where you just see all these uh, people, like sheep, like just going, like, and then you just see, and then you just see him and like a black sheep, like he's, he's different, you know. But you saw flat screen t TVs in modern times. I mean, it was a, it was a film ahead of its time. So uh, what I want to transition to now is uh, the pre-code era. Anybody know what the pre-code era was in motion pictures? Oh, okay. This is fascinating. Um, so I would say from, I mean, people can make the argument, I would say from 1928, because talkie, talkies came from 1927, 26-ish, when the jazz singer came. So I would... Uh, I would say from 1928 to 1934, but some people will want to say even from 1928 to 1932, depends who you talk to, but I guess I would say from 1928 to 1934 ish. Um, there were films that came out that dealt with many different uh, taboo subjects adultery, um, homosexuality, divorce, which was, you know, in those days, just a very uh, controversial thing, uh, prostitution. Uh, and you even saw some nudity in some films from that that small period because so there, there was a production code that was written but nobody necessarily enforced it um, so there, there, there was um, a movie called the the divorcee which I will see if I can find a clip of that for you with an actress named uh, Norma uh, Shire anybody here Norma Shire mm -hmm. yeah so she was in the divorcee she did a lot of pre-code films. And in the divorcee, I believe she played like, like a vamp, you know, type of character. Um, so William Hayes was the one that wrote the production code, meaning that you can't show nudity, uh, no, you know, no homosexuality, no adultery, no cursing, no cursing of course. Uh, because if you notice, films in, during those periods were not rated. There was no R or PG-13. Like, you would always see old movies that would say not rated. And, so, and just to give you some context, uh, every film prior to 1950, half of them have been destroyed. Half of them are not, haven't even been preserved uh, because they used a certain material, uh, sulf, uh, it, it, sulfides, yeah. sulfine, yeah. And then they would be in the warehouses, and a lot of them, you know, in the sun, from the sun of the warehouses, a lot of them would burn and they would get damaged. Um, so, so during the pre-code era, filmmakers were allowed to say whatever they wanted to say and do because nobody enforced the production code. So um, I'm going to just show you a, a little montage of some of the pre-code films. You're going to be actually pretty surprised if anybody has not seen pre-code films that during the, that period in cinema that you saw a lot of very provocative films for, for, for those times. You know, today, you know, maybe not as much. It's more in your face today, but... It was very provocative for those times. What about foreign films? Well, I mean, yeah, well, there was uh, the Italians, you know, the Italian French, you know. I mean, uh, you know, Italians, which I'm going to get into as well, they did some uh, films before uh, neorealism. Uh, they did these uh, white telephone films, and they were actually um, films that were kind of trying to emulate uh, slapstick uh, comedies, American <laughs> comedies. Uh, okay, so let's do these pre-code films here. Uh, I, mean, right, I mean, right there, that's provocative for those times. Uh, Clark Gable was a pre-code actor. Uh, Gary Cooper was a pre-code actor. Barbara Stanley. Like away all my privileges. There's one privilege you can't take away from me, a dirty little snake. What are you? What are you doing playing poker? Yeah, but I don't like it much. Oh, then you never played strip poker. There's a game. <laughs> How do you play that? Just regular poker. Only instead of the bets, the loser has to take off some gum. It's lots of fun. 
That's James Cagney. shocking things here. Um, so basically, um, when the production code was written during Divorcee, which was starring an actress named Norma uh, Shire, who was married to the mogul uh, Irving Thalberg. I don't know if anybody knows. Yeah. Norma Shire. Did I say Shire? Yeah. Norma Shire, excuse me. Norma Shire. Uh, Norma Shire was married to Irving uh, Thalberg. So, you know, during the divorce, say they had written it. So what happened was how the, they were able to eventually enforce the production code. So, um, yeah, I mean, there were certain groups that were formed during that period. Uh, namely, there was one called the uh, Catholic Legion of Decency. So, you know, they were monitoring films to just see if it, you know, it, if it aligned with their religious beliefs. Um, so, the production code was not enforced. And around, you know, 1933, 1934, around that, that, that period, these groups um, approached the Bank of America, which was founded by these brothers, the Nietzsche brothers. And they were actually financing the films. They were giving the money, giving the loans to finance these films. So these groups, like, uh, the Catholic Legions of Decency, uh, you know, they they went to the Nietzsche brothers and they said, hey, you know, because they were strong Catholics, so they said, you know, the money that you're giving out and you're loaning to these filmmakers are actually going to this, and you know, I don't know if you would approve of this, you know, so they pretty much Nietzsche brothers went to the studios, went to the producers, and pretty much said, look. We will stop financing you if you continue to do this, unless you enforce the production code. So really, the reason why they enforced it was money. And um, Jack Warner, the founder of Warner Brothers, had this really innovative idea, said, why don't we try the, the rating system? But of course, the rating system did not get enforced. So check this out. So in 1934, the production code was enforced. And you, do you know what film changed the trajectory and, and what you know, inspired to get into the rating system? So you go from 1934 all the way to 1967, 1968, Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, wow. Bonnie and Clyde cha uh, changed that. 
And then eventually they got to the rating system. I mean, there was a film called uh, Midnight Cowboy in 1969 with Dustin Hoffman and John Voight. That film was rated X. Yeah, in those days. I mean, but if you saw it today, I mean, it would just be an R film. But it was ahead of its time. And it, I, you know, and it won Oscars, etc. So, um, it's an Oscar nominated film. Um, but it took that long. I mean, that, that's something. From 1934 to 1968, 67, 68-ish, the rating system came into play. All right, so um, I wanted to show you a few uh, interesting, uh, with, I wanted to just, with relation to the pre-code movement here. And, 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 and just to give you a little bit of context as well, uh, what, um, so when the production code was enforced, I mean, still, I mean, there was some opposition with, you know, some of the filmmakers. And because, you know, we're artists, because in those days, movies were considered products. They were not considered art how they are today. Because eventually, uh, it got passed through Congress that films now are considered art. So they cannot be infringed upon. You could say anything you want to say, because you, you have that protection under that, you know, initiative, that it's art. But back then, films were considered products. So th there was rules on what to say. So if so, eventually the producers and the filmmakers came to an agreement with, you know, the, the, the production code, William Hayes, all that, the Hayes office, um, that if you're going to film something that's immoral, there has to be a moral consequence at the end. So if you notice, like, if anybody ever saw those old uh, gangster pictures, those Warner Brothers gangster pictures with James Cagney, uh, Edward G. Robinson, Angels with Dirty Faces is one that, one of my favorites that I love, uh, or um, another, another Little Caesar. So they would do um, unvirtuous things, you know, um, but there would always have to be a moral consequence by virtue of the unvirtuous. So, um, and I'm going to just show you an example of that, um, which is one of my favorite movies, uh, Angels with Dirty Faces, uh, with, uh, with James Cagney. Uh, that was, it was directed by uh, Michael Curtiz, who directed uh, Casablanca, who was a Hungarian director. And, you know, a lot of filmmakers, you know, they came from uh, Eastern Europe. They were Eastern Europeans, mainly of, you know, primarily Jewish descent. Um, all right, so I'm going to just show you this because, you know, the James Cagney character, you know, he, he killed a cop in the movie. So you can't, you know, you can't let him go. So that's why you notice films in those days always had that moral consequence. It's great quality, too. <coughs> And you notice how Cagney shrugs his shoulders. He used to see a guy in New York that would always do that and use that. Yeah, I, it's... Who was that? Edmund O'Brien? Yeah. No, uh, not Edmund O'Brien. Uh, Yeah, sorry about the sounds. Most... And you know, he, um, what is it, Pat O'Brien, Pat O'Brien, right. Uh, so you know, Pat O'Brien tells uh, James Cagney, because uh, in the film, I don't know if you guys remember the Dead End Kids. Yes. Uh, they, they were in that film, and they looked up to the Cagney character, so uh, Pat O'Brien told uh, James Cagney, can you act scared? 
Um, so the kids know, you know, can, it can be a deterrent for the kids so they don't end up like you because they look up to you. The character's name was Rocky Sullivan. So there was some interpretation of that film, like, was he really afraid or was he just doing that for the kids? So it kind of left it a little bit, you know, for interpretation. Um, I want, I want to um, show you this film that took place during the uh, pre-code era, uh, Euro European film. I guess Mike had asked me uh, about some foreign films. I'm going to show you one. I have this link here. And uh, so this film was co-written by, uh, this was one of the first surrealist film. It was co-written by Salvador Dali. Um, I don't know if anybody knew that Salvador Dali was involved with films. I mean, not only he was a surrealist artist, but he was uh, involved in films. And uh, this film really uh, disregards all logic, you know, because there's an infamous shot of a woman, her eye is being sliced with a razor. So I'm going to show you this in another period, and you're going to be shocked that I feel I mean, uh, that this was taking place. And actually, this film was, it came out in 1929. So, during the pre-code period. With very uh, ominous music. I'm going to show you the scene here. to something else. I don't think, and not many people knew that this was taking place during this period, but check this one out.
this one is still up with the... Yeah. Alright, well I guess you guys have the idea. <laughs> um, and, I, and I just wanted just to preface, I apologize in advance if I'm, if you're watching a clip and that you're engaged in it and I just leave you hanging. Because uh, i got to kind of move on, but... Um, but yeah, that, that film definitely was ahead of its time. Has anybody ever seen that film before? That image? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty surreal. Uh, yeah, the movie is about, yeah, 22 minutes or so. Uh, okay. I just wanted to ask you something. You know, sure. During this period, it was a very significant period because the Depression started in 1929. Did that have any effect at all on, on the pre-code and the after code and all, the fact that, you know, the whole country was in the midst of this serious depression. Do you think that that had any kind of influence? Well, in terms of, like, financing the films, or oh, just... Oh, oh, with the change, with having, you know, the, the roaring 20s were going on when the uh, pre-code, so it right. fit very well with, you know, hang loose. And right. then uh, when you got the depression on, it seems like it would be more likely to really get, you know, enforce strict rules kind of thing. Well, I mean, you know, in terms of the depression, I mean, I know there were a lot of filmmakers that wanted to say something about the times and wanted to, there was a lot of depression films, you know, um, and, and also too, it was, it was actually depression proof, the movie industry, they were, they were all making money in those days. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, that's a very broad question. I mean, the, you know, uh, the depression affected filmmakers in many different aspects and films. They influenced a lot of films. I think the depression influenced films um, and also the films sometimes, um, you know, like the Italians actually were very good with that. And I'm gonna get to that, like in terms of neorealism and they would make a lot of films like Bicycle Thief and they would make, I mean, of course that was more post depression but uh, they would make a lot of films to say something, you know, about the Also that weird stuff. stuff, like when you were showing, when you, it reminded me of like in the 60s with Louis Bunnell films and stuff. You started to get a lot of very interesting weird stuff then too. Right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's definitely surrealism. I mean, even to a filmmaker that reminds me a little bit of this, uh, and I don't know if anybody knows David Lynch, he's a modern filmmaker who's very much... Um, adopts this particular surrealist style. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so I want to talk about, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump a little bit. Um, I want to talk about World War II. Um, now, the, the films that happened during that period. So, you know, in, in, you know, in, those, in those days, uh, it, it was a completely different time. Um, you know, especially after Pearl Harbor, um, there were lines of people waiting to enlist, including movie stars. Um, you know, Clark Gable was in World War II. Jimmy Stewart was in World War II. Kirk Douglas served in World War II. Um, and there, there was a, a group of uh, directors, five directors, that... So, okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna backtrack a little bit. So, the Roosevelt administration wanted to sell the war, because at first, they did not want to get dragged into World War II, but of course, Pearl Harbor, you know, changed that. Uh, so, they wanted to make propaganda films. Now, you know, in those days, propaganda wasn't really, Please try again. Uh, you know, a bad word. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't as taboo as it is today, I mean, Propaganda in those days was synonymous with advertising. I mean, that's what it was. So Roosevelt wanted to sell the war to the American people, Roosevelt administration. So uh, a group of five directors went to World War II and they, they joined various military branches and, um, and formed film units. Does anybody know who those five directors were? that went to World War II to capture the footage that we've seen? John Ford. Okay, John Ford, very good. Anybody else? What's that? Capra. You know, and you know, Capra, he actually, uh, he 
went to Caltech and he majored in uh, chemical engineering. We have a fellow engineer here. Um, and um, he went to Princeton, I mean, he was a captain, I think, uh, or no, Jimmy Stewart went to Princeton, but he was a, a colonel too. But yes, Capra is another one. Anybody else? Well, he took my class, he knows it. Mike, you know, take my uh, Okay, so John Houston, Frank Capra, John Ford, anybody else know who the other two are? Uh, so uh, George Stevens and William Wyler. Uh, and William Wyler, man, he, was, he did a lot of takes. Um, so they all filmed various, uh, you know, unit. They all formed various units. And there's actually a very infamous story of uh, Capra, uh, where he he's going to meet with uh, all these, uh, you know, military, uh, you know, generals and colonels, and there's this this huge like long table, and there's a general sitting at the head, and then they're like. The general asks him, are you, are you the movie guy? And he goes, well, yeah, since I'm the movie guy, I'm the one that sits at the head of the table, <laughs> you know? Um, but it was very remarkable, you know, the courage of them, you know, of those, not only actors that went, but directors that were, yes, you have a question? I have a question, yeah. So were they uh, enlisted first and then they said, oh, you should lead a film, film group, or were they recruited specifically to do? Some of, them, well, some, some of them did enlist, and some, some were recruited. I believe Ford, uh, uh, I believe Ford was in the Navy. Um, yeah, some did enlist, uh, and Ca uh, Capra enlisted. And were they all well, well known at that point, or they were just sort of well, getting- Oh, they were well known, were... oh, oh yeah, they, oh, they were well known. I mean, some of the films that they had already done at that period, um, I mean, we're we're pretty uh, we're pretty astounding. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to refer to my defer to my notes. I'm sorry. Give me a second. Um, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, you know, you know, Capra. I mean, Capra had did uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington at that time. I mean. You know, 1939, you know, was regarded as, you know, you had Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you had Gone with the Wind. Um, it's not my phone. Uh, those, and, uh, you know, John Ford had some very impressive output, too. Um, and, you know, John Houston was already a screen, was a screenwriter at that time um, as well. Um, and I believe he already had done the Maltese Falcon, which was the first film he directed with Humphrey Bogart. Um, and uh, John, John Ford, uh, you know, he did Stagecoach, How Green Is My Valley, from, uh, he did Young Lincoln, Grapes of Wrath, from 1939 to 1941. Impressive output. George Stevens did Woman of the Year, which was uh, the first film that uh, brought Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Um, you know, and then, you know, he did those uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy uh, shorts uh, as well. Um, so, you know, yeah, they were, they were definitely known. And, and actually, Capra at that time was, um, like, Time Magazine's, like, richest man. Uh, he was, like, one of the richest men, and, uh, they referred to him as Columbia's gem. Um, you know, he did, a, 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 it happened in one night, Mr. Deeds, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, of course, and later, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Um, so, yeah, so they were, they were all very known, um, at that time. Um, and it, it really affected, it really affected them, uh, in, in, you know, in many different ways. Um, it affected, I, I'll just, I'll just kind of harness on two of them. Now, all the footage that you have probably seen of the, and I, you know, of course, I'm not going to show it here, but of the Holocaust, um, George Stevens captured that. George Stevens went to Dachau, went to many concentration camps, and filmed it, and which were used in the uh, Nuremberg uh, trials. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, there actually I was going to tell you, reference that to you, but there is actually a lawyer, uh, a Nuremberg lawyer, that's still alive because they interviewed him to, to discuss. He's like 107, 106, and he's alert. He's with it. Uh, and I see, see her nodding, and she probably knows. They, you know, during you know, you know the war that's happening currently with, in Europe, uh, so they had interviewed him, and he was talking about this and saying, "I never thought I would, you know, see something like this at, uh, subsequent to the Nuremberg trials." Um, so, 
Uh, now, William Wyler was greatly affected by what he saw in World War II. Um, and he did a film, and he wanted to say, he wanted to say something about what he saw, and, and, and about those times, and about the effects of PTSD, which at that time, uh, there was no word for that. It was considered shell shock or battle fatigue. That's what they used to remedy post-traumatic stress. So he made a movie called Best Years of Our Lives. See that film? Yeah. Yeah. Great film. Because there was a lot of, there were, you know, there was a lot of films that would capture some of the, some, you know, war, World War II, there's many of them. And, you know, I think, I think some people's initial reaction was like, all right, just another war film of bullshit, excuse my French. But it wasn't bullshit. I mean, it really was a very telling film, and it was very reflective of what the soldier went through, goes through, went through, especially in uh, PTSD, uh, which at that time, obviously, there was no uh, term for that. Um, so yeah, uh, Best Years of, of Our Lives was directed by William Wyler. It was starring um, Frederick March. Anybody know Frederick March? Mm -hmm. Dana Andrews. Uh, it's a great, uh, great film he did called Boomerang, the Ilya Kazan film. I highly recommend it. Um, Harold Russell. Anybody know who Harold Russell was? Okay. Harold, Harold Russell was actually a real veteran, and uh, he actually. So the character, the character actually has these hooks, you know, these prosthetic hands. Um, in the film, originally they were gonna. The screenwriter Sherwood. Uh, was going to do it, was going to write, the character had a brain problem, like a brain injury, but of course PTSD didn't really exist, well it existed, but there was no term for that in those days, so they didn't really know how to work with that, you know, they didn't know how to work with it, so they decided to just go with the hands, you know, and Harold Russell actually lost his hands in a training accident, the military exercise, um, and then uh, the actress uh, Virginia Mayo uh, was in it too, uh, and uh, I believe Teresa Wright was in that film as well. So Teresa Wright, yeah. So it, so it, it, it so it was a, it was a great film. So I wanted to show you a clip, um, and I feel that it. I, I think in a in a sense this scene. Of course, I'll never know, but I, I just in terms of how I would interpret it, because a lot of times when you see when you watch a movie, and I'll, I'll just give a good example of a film. Uh, uh, anybody see the movie? This is a, modern, a contemporary film, but There Will Be Blood with Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, yeah, so that was a great film. Uh, and, and they say it was based on the Doheny's. And just to give you a little interesting context, if you watch There Will Be Blood, uh, uh, and you watch it again, listen to Daniel Day-Lewis's accent. His speech patterns were in the same cadence as John Huston's. So if, because you know, John Huston had a very distinctive voice. Uh, so, anyways, because... Uh, but the, the score, it was just, it had this score that it was just, it, it was in your face, the music. And I think that represented what the character was going psychologically, that score. So in a sense, I feel the scene I'm going to show you with Dana Andrews was somewhat reflective of what William, how this affected William Wilder, what he wanted to say in this uh, picture. All right, so here we go. Sorry about the sound. This movie won Best Picture at the Oscars. Uh, Louis Mumer was the uh, studio. MGM. I believe that's Teresa Wright. Teresa Wright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that Teresa? Yeah, Teresa Wright. Uh -huh. uh, here, I'm, and I'm going to just I want to show you another clip here, um, in, re in reference to that film. So, I, you know, because you know World War Two, that, that, that I mean that. I mean, that affected a lot of people coming back. Um, and, you know, th this, this kind of breaks my heart a little bit, too, um, when I see this, because, you know, 
I'm sure there are a lot of stories like this, especially even today with some of the wars that have happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, that when the soldier goes away and comes back, and maybe he has missing limbs or some psychological um, imbalance, that will they be accepted? A lot of soldiers fear that coming home. Like, will my spouse, my girlfriend, my parents, will they accept me? You know? Um, so this, this particular clip, I think, really um, harnesses on that. So um, encompasses that. So I'm going to um, show you that clip. Well, this is with Harold Russell. And I believe he won an Oscar for this performance or was nominated. So he's coming home, but I'm going to just show you the shot when his girlfriend sees him. And you see he's hiding his hands. And Teresa Wright won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. Scene there, um, and, and and this one too, I think, uh, speaks a lot to what the soldier you know has to endure. Especially, I think, even Vietnam, you know, a lot they they probably took the the worst burden coming back. You know, people would refer to them, you know, as baby killers and yell things at them. And yeah, it was just a very uh, unfortunate thing. So there's a scene where. There's a scene here I'm going to show you that where, and that's the thing with filmmaking too, that a, a lot of it is, uh, you know, there's a lot of experimentation and improvisation. So there's a scene where Dana Andrews is walking through these airfields and he sees these empty planes. And he was a pilot. And it's like almost like we did all this and now what do we do now? Everything is empty, you know, and he's just walking through these airfields and wondering why was I even here? Like, um, and when they went to uh, shoot it, 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 they didn't know, Sherwood, the writer, did not know how to write this scene. So he pretty much told Dana Andrews and Wilma Wyler just to handle it. So this, this take is just I, something just very spontaneous, but it, I think it just says a lot about the emptiness. Because I know that there are some soldiers that come back and say, what was the point of all this? You know, I went, I risked my life, I did this and now. Life is moving on without. Well, a lot of that was Vietnam. Vietnam, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, sorry, showed being re for the sake of being repetitive. Sorry. Skip a little bit just for time restraints. So it's in the cockpit having a flashback.
And then he eventually, I think, asks for the job, gets a job. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's, you know, and, and, and that's what I love about film. It's not only can it entertain, but it can also, you know, educate and it can reflect, you know, humanity and reflect um, society and throw society really, you know, into your face and one can't help but reflect and hopefully see life maybe differently from a different perspective. Um, and uh, yeah, and the cinematographer was a, who was a great cinematographer on this was a guy named Greg Toll. He just did some really great work on that. Uh, okay. So, uh, And I do want to I do want to reference a little. Uh, I mean, this film uh, was made in 1960, but it has something to do with World War II, and I did reference it. So I want to show you this clip. I don't know if I have it in my. Bear with me. Bear with me. Sorry. Judgment Nurmer, why did you see the clip? Judgment Nurmer? Oh yeah, right here we go. Yeah, okay. So I want to actually show you Judgment Nurmer because we we, we we talked about how that that um, because George Stevens, you know, he captured the footage that was seen in the Nuremberg trials. And if anybody uh, is, that's not familiar with it, after World War II, there was a tribunal of American judges that were judging German judges. And it was very controversial, but because these judges were breaking the law, but at the same time, they were committing crimes in the name of the law, you know, sentencing people to death for having a relationship with a Jewish person, you know, et cetera. Um, but this film, I, I think, was very reflective of those times. And um, so it was starring uh, Spencer Tracy, uh, Montgomery Clift. Anybody remember Montgomery Clift? Um, Richard Winmark, exactly. Maximilian Schell, who, who won an Oscar for it, it who was the uh, brother of the actress Maria Schell. Yeah. Um, so I, I just would like to show you this scene, too, because I actually really like Clift a lot as an actor. He was one of my favorite actors, Clift, Brando, John Garfield, from that period. You know, there was such a, there was such a completeness to their work. Now, I don't know if anybody knows this about Montgomery Clift. I know I'm somewhat deviating a little bit, but... Uh, just to give you a little background, but Montgomery Cliff, you know, he was the sex symbol. Uh, you know, when he made movies like A Place in the Sun, that, that's a good example. Uh, and he was very close with Elizabeth Taylor. And one day he was driving from a, a party in the Hollywood Hills with Elizabeth Taylor and got into a car accident, smashed a tree, and uh, it disfigured his face. And um, actually, he almost died. Elizabeth Taylor saved his life. He was choking on his tooth, and Elizabeth Taylor went in and scooped the tooth out. So th this really, you know, this, th this disfigured his face, and he wasn't the same actor. He was actually making a movie at that time, and if you see it, if you see that film that he made, he, uh, and I'm blanking out of the name, please forgive me, uh, you see him looking a certain way as this sex symbol, and then later in the film, you see he just looks completely different. Oh, wow. You know, and um, did, any, did anybody know that about the movie? Yeah, Clift? Yeah. 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 Allison was in the boat. What's that? That, that? that was a different one. The Place of the Sun was in a boat where he kills uh, Shelley Winters. Right, Shelley Winters. Yeah, yeah. yeah and Elizabeth Taylor was in that film too. But, but anyways, but this has, uh, so this is a great, this is a great scene. Uh, Judgment of Nuremberg was written by a guy named Abby Mann. It was originally a play. Now, Spencer Tracy, um, I'm going to get to Tracy uh, in a second, but um, I think was one of, the, one of the greatest movie actors ever. I mean, the camera just loved him, and the littlest things just read in his face. But, so, so this scene I'm going to show you, I actually feel this is Montgomery Clift. Like, this is him. And he was a very frail man, very vulnerable man. And this is just an idea of the cruelty that, that came out of these trials.
I may skip a little just for time restraints, but sorry, the sound is terrible on this, sorry. And there's Richard Winmark. His, his character was sterilized for political reasons. And you can see how Spencer Trace is very affected by this. Sorry, I'm going to just skip this a little. I didn't realize it was this long. Um, I love Tracy, just his expressions, every little thing red in his face. Was the court in constituted like this one? Was there an audience? An audience? Yeah. Like a criminal. I could not say anything. I could not do anything. I, I had to lay there. I my mother. What do you say about her? She was a woman. They accused her of being feeble minded. She was a hard working woman. And she just not say it. Not say it. What do you say? He's trying to say you're mentally ill, that's why they sterilize you. You're the next nice Michelle character. I want to show you. I have here a picture. Her picture. I would like to look at it. I would like you to judge. But I want that you tell me, was she feeble minded? My mother. Was she feeble minded? Was she? She didn't want to be the time back to the tribunal. 